bracket with UPSC CSC at an academy. So I'm your friend, educator and mentor. Briefly about me, uh, I have three years of teaching experience and I graduated from BIT Mesra Raji. Appeared for civil services, four mains in an interview and uh, got my MBA and HR degree from XLRI Jamshedpur. So welcome friends with your mentor educator Siddhi Vangar. At an academy, we provide you daily life classes. I am currently taking daily life classes on prelims mock test series. And uh, we also have life test and quizzes. So each one of our courses has a live test after uh, every three sessions. So I have my science and technology course already running on the Unacademy platform where we have provided you with live test and quizzes so that you can hone your preparation. Also notes are provided to you after every session. You can download them in the PDF format. We also provide you with structured courses which is aligned with the examination syllabus. All right. That means all your prelim syllabus, main syllabus, they're completely aligned with whatever we teach you. And with one subscription of an academy, you get unlimited access to all the courses under the UPSC CSE category. That means you never have to pay again for another course that you will be attending here. For example, if you uh, take a subscription for my course in science and technology, which is running on an academy, you don't have to take subscription for other courses that you might want to attend on our art platform. Everything is then completely free. So you have access to greater than 200 courses, which are both live, upcoming and recorded courses for free after just one subscription. All the top educators teach on our platform. Sudarshan is there, Brunal is there, Roman is there and your beloved teacher Siddhi is also there. And we cover every course that is under the sun for UPSC complete till the interview preparation. So we complete the entire chain of UPSC preparation, prelims, mains and interviews. So that you never have to go to any other place. You can be here and complete your entire preparation with us. And our one year subscription actually costs you less than 40,000, which is actually 44,000, but it costs you less than 40,000 if you use my code SBUS. And we have a no cost EMI for 6 month, 12 month and 24 month subscriptions. And for our two year courses, our cost comes down to less than 58,000. If you use my code SBUS, our monthly course, our monthly subscription fee for our 24 month courses, less than 3000. So if you use my code SBUS, you get it in less than 58,000 or a per year fee actually comes down to less than 29,000. And this is no cost EMI available on a 6 month, 12 month and 24 month subscription. With that, let's proceed to our India IR series part 3. So it's the Eastern Neighbours part 3. We have under the Eastern Neighbours already discussed Nepal. So first part Eastern Neighbours was India Nepal relations part 1. Second part of Eastern Neighbours part 2 was India Nepal relations part 2 whenever when we discussed the Kalapani issue in detail. And we also discuss the way forward to for the betterment of India-Nepal relationships. Today we'll be discussing uh, India Eastern Neighbors Part Three, under which we will be discussing India and Sri Lanka in total. I might split this session into two if it goes on for long, because I want maximum absorption to be there for whatever I teach. So it is India-Sri Lanka today, and how are we going to proceed? We'll just look at some ancient ties about uh, that we have with Sri Lanka, the history that India has with Sri Lanka. And then we'll go on to look at the areas of cooperation we have with Sri Lanka and the areas of disagreement we have with Sri Lanka. So let's start today's session. The contents of today's class, as I already told you, is India-Sri Lanka relations. And first we we'll know about Sri Lanka as a country and Sri Lanka as a neighbor. And what is the importance of Sri Lanka? Why are we even studying it? So this is a part of the Asia series edition of the IR series. And we are actually trying to study our neighbors in great detail. Because as of now, the focus of our present government is on act east policy and neighborhood first policy since 2014. Even this government and even the government previous to it, that is a UPA government, they were all very much focused on the neighborhood. So much so that our uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh ended up saying that your 
relationship with your neighbors actually determine how influential how effective your foreign policy is and hence first of all we are focusing on our neighbors with that let's first understand about india's eastern neighbors so we have already covered china indo china relationships in greater detail in india china part 1 and india china part 2 and the videos on galwan valley we have already covered india nepal india nepal part 1 and india nepal part 2 now let's move on to sri lanka with sri lanka we really don't have a land border what we share with sri lanka is a maritime boundary and the borders that we share with sri lanka are extremely small because these two countries are very very closely placed in fact you will be surprised to know that the uh, maximum distance between the farthest island in sri lanka and the farthest island uh, on the indian coast is just 12 kilometers in the sea so that's very very extremely close and in fact this closeness is a as a reason for the closeness in cultural and religious ties but this closeness is also a re uh, reason of some of the fishing disputes that we have at sri lanka which we are both going to study in very detail today these borders are manned by the indian navy the population of sri lanka is just 21 million so can you just see the size difference that india has with sri lanka please keep in mind the neighborhood policies that we have discussed in lectures 2 and 3 that the size of india the economic heft of india has always been a source of anxiety for our neighbors and that is one of the reasons they actually try to get to close to china so please carefully watch these numbers 21 million versus 1.35 billion just 92.50 billion uh, gdp compared to a 3 trillion dollar economy however the amazing part is that both these countries are democracies Sri Lanka follows a semi-presidential system and India follows a parliamentary legislature system. However, if you see Sri Lanka even after being a very very minuscule a small small island compared to the heft that India enjoys in the Indian subcontinent area wise, Sri Lanka at is at a much higher human development index than us. It is considered to be highly developed or a uh, high um, high country in a human development index way way ahead of india at the rank 71 even ahead of china which has a rank of 85 as per the 2019 hdi rankings and india is at a position of 129 so when we compare ourselves to our neighbors some of our neighbors are doing really well in the human development index so let's look at the position of sri lanka can you see sri lanka is here and this actually is known the tip of sri lanka this tip of sri lanka is actually known as the zafna peninsula which was very much in news because this was the peninsula which was occupied by the litte or liberation tamil uh, liberation tigers of the tamil elam which was declared to be a terrorist outfit by india in 1992 after the assassination of rajiv gandhi we have two important water bodies here that is important so on this side of sri lanka we have gulf of manar getting its name from the manar island which is the farthest island from sri lanka closest to india and this end the closer end to andhra pradesh is known as the park strait so india and sri lanka are actually separated by these two water important water bodies gulf of manar and park strait the small uh, the small path between the neighbors india and sri lanka is called the park strait a strait is actually a water body that separates two pieces of land okay so this is a very ancient picture of sangamitta or uh, ashoka's daughter going to sri lanka with the bodhi sapling in order to actually spread the buddhism now India Sri Lanka have ties that go back to 2500 years in the past or in the ancient past when in the 4th BCE Sangamitta and Mahindra actually went Ashoka son and daughter actually went to Sri Lanka to spread Buddhism and this is uh, king Devanampiya Tissa the then uh, Devanampiya Tissa the then ruler of sri lanka who actually is uh, 
with veneration, with a lot of veneration, putting to his heads the bodhi sapling which was carried on by Sangam Mitta to Sri Lanka. So Mahinda said he cannot actually go as a woman there. He, he actually can't do this. He cannot take this bodhi sapling. So then Ashoka sent both his son and daughter with the bodhi sapling. It was the right arm or the right branch of the bodhi tree in Bodh Gaya that was sent to Sri Lanka. So we have ties going back to spreading of Buddhism. That's 4th century BC when we actually went to Sri Lanka to spread Buddhism. And this is King Devnam Priyatessa who is actually looking at, uh, at it with a lot of veneration. And that's when Buddhism actually formally entered Sri Lanka to 2500 years back. So if you look at that, with Sri Lanka, we have cultural ties, obviously. We have religious ties in terms of Buddhism. We have linguistic ties in terms of Tamils. So Tamils, which are uh, out of 77 million Tamils in the world, 60 million Tamils actually reside in India and 4 million Tamils actually reside in Sri Lanka. They are the greatest minority in Sri Lanka, about which we will also study in detail. So with that, we have a lot of cultural, religious and linguistic and intellectual ties that we share with Sri Lanka. With that, let's just get to know a little bit more about Sri Lanka. So Sri Lanka is actually a plantation economy. It's known for its rubber, tea and coffee plantations, which it also exports to India. Also paper and a pepper. Both paper and pepper are also exported by Sri Lanka to India and to the rest of the world. So it's known for its rubber, tea, coffee, pepper and paper plantations. The climate of Sri Lanka with the slowly rolling plains, not, not very high hills, but mild rolling plains, hot and humid climate because it's an island nation, are very, very suitable for growing rubber, tea, coffee and paper. Uh, so the trees that make paper, they are very uh, found in abundance in Sri Lanka. And obviously, it is very rich in forest cover and pepper. It has the second largest GDP in terms of purchasing power parity when it compares to all the South Asian nations. So, amongst the South Asian nations, it has the second largest GDP in terms of purchasing power parity and not the nominal GDP we are talking here. So, purchasing power GDP is different from the nominal GDP. And it is considered to be one of the fastest emerging economies Post the civil wars, the 26 year civil wars ended in Sri Lanka, which began in May 1976 with the establishment of Litte or Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam and ended in 2009, 4th February 2009. If you study about the politics of Sri Lanka, you will be surprised to know that we were colonized by the British, but Sri Lankans have a rich history of being colonized first by the Portuguese, then by the Dutch and then by the British. So when you look at Sri Lankan architecture, Sri Lankan way of culture, they are actually influenced by all these three great Western powers, the Portuguese, the Dutch or the British. And Sri Lanka was earlier known as Ceylon till 1948 when it gained its independence and it actually took on the name Sri Lanka officially only in 1972 and that's why even in certain quarters till now Sri Lanka is still called Ceylon which it was given the name by the Portuguese sailors. It had 26 years of civil war as I told you. That was because of the skirmish that happened between the Tamils which are the greatest minority in Sri Lanka. Close to 9% of the population is Tamils and the rest of the population 81% to 85% uh, population is that of the Simhala majority, the native people of Sri Lanka. So there was a tussle between them because during the British times, while the British were ruling Sri Lanka, Tamilans were given, uh, Tamilans, there was favoritism with, which was in favor of the Tamilans and the Simhala majority of the country actually did not like it. So basically the British did the same thing that they did in India which they did in Sri Lanka, that they tried to split the people against each other. Here they did it on the Hindu-Muslim religi uh, religion basis. There they did it on majority and minority basis. So they tried to appease the minority, the Tamilans there, and not the Sinhalese people, which were their original natives. So when finally Sri Lanka got independence, the Sinhalese or the majority tried to push the minority or the Tamilans into corner, which actually resulted into a 26-year civil war 
विच एक्चुअली प्लस श्रीलंका इकोनॉमी बैक अदरवाइज श्रीलंका इवन इन द एंशियंट टाइम्स इज एक्सट्रीमली एक्सट्रीमली रिच नेशन नेशन वेरी फेमस फॉर इट्स ट्रेड एंड इट्स कल्चर एंड दैट इज द रीजन इट गॉट कॉलोनाइज बाई नॉट वन बट थ्री पावर्स and that civil war only ended in 2009 we will also discuss that civil war in detail and india's role in the civil war that was going on in sri lanka for 26 big years the politics of sri lanka is sri lanka is a unitary state with semi presidential system so what does that mean a unitary state means it does not believe in federalism so no power is given to the provinces which is again a major irritant in sri lankan politics till now tamilans are still fighting to run some of their area so tamilans are actually mostly found in the northern and the eastern province where india is also doing a lot of developmental activities after the civil war has ended so tamilan wa tamilans want that the provinces which are governed by the tamil parties there they should be given more autonomy but sri lanka still refuses to do that and we'll discuss the 13th amendment also which is related to that so it basically does not believe in federalism it believes in one supreme power that is the center so it's a unitary state unlike india which is a quasi federal state it also has a semi presidential system now what do we mean by a semi presidential system that means here we both have a president and a prime minister supported by his cabinet but how is the prime minister and the cabinet selected so the president needs to have a majority in the parliament he then chooses the prime minister and the cabinet which is approved by the parliament which is which has to be supportive of the president so the president needs to have a majority in the parliament but it is only the prime minister and the cabinet ministers which are responsible to the cab, uh, which are responsible to the parliament now so once chosen the prime minister and the cabinet they are not only responsible to the parliament if they are to be removed they are to be removed by the parliament only just like it happens in india and that is why it is a semi presidential system and not a complete presidential system like we have in the us all right in the us you don't have a premier or you don't have a prime minister here you also have a prime minister and cabinet and you also have a president so it is somewhere between the parliamentary system that india has vis-a-vis -vis the presidential system the us has all right socially we have ancient royal ties with india sri lanka has ancient royal ties with india what does that mean so before european colonialism before portuguese or the dutch or the british actually came in sri lanka sri lanka has been a part of the ancient indian kingdoms we know about the chola empire right in the medieval times in the ancient times so sri lanka has always been a part of the royal ties with india buddhism so uh, the Buddhism is not declared to be a state religion or a religion of uh, the state of Sri Lanka but it gets actually special privileges in the constitution and that is one way India and Sri Lanka actually connect in fact now buddhists are a minority in india but they are a majority in other nations like burma china bhutan and obviously sri lanka so buddhism has got special privileges in the constitution and these special privileges were actually given in 1972 which is also a watershed year because it was at this time that sinhala was actually declared as the language of the state which actually created or ruffled a lot of feathers in the tamilian minority because they were being cornered and which was one of the trigger causes apart from all the anti tamilian riots that were going on and a lot of tamilians were being killed in 1956 1958 which was one of this declaration of the sinhala language as the state language one of the reasons that liberation tigers of tamil elam in 1976 was formed under velu pillai prabhakaran so please remember this date so sinhalis is a majority 85% people are sinhalis or the native uh, sri lankans and tamils are a minority approximately 9% of people are tamilans sri lanka in the ancient times was known as tamba pani tamba pani means color of red so the hands of the people working in the agriculture areas or the manufacturing areas in the ancient past they used to get red because the soil of sri lanka is red in color so they used to get red hands and hence it was known as tamba pani in the ancient times geography geographically sri lanka is a part of the indian subcontinent it has a area far lesser than 0.15 million square kilometers a very very minuscule area and it has a coastline 
which is approximately 1500 kilometers. So compared to India, which has a 7500 co kilometer coastline, it has a coastline of 1500 kilometers. And ironically, the economic zone or economic uh, exclusive zone EEZ of Sri Lanka, which extends into the sea to around 200 nautical miles is far higher, is almost seven times higher than the entire coast of Sri Lanka itself. So that's an interesting fact about Sri Lanka. It's an island nation surrounded by water on all the three sides and separated by Gulf of Manar and Park Strait from India. So India is one of its huge neighbors. It is well-known trading hub. So even in the ancient times, Sri Lanka had a very, very rich history, a very, very influential trader in the world, just like India was. And it was a well-known trading hub, both in Far East, that means Japan and beyond, and Europe. And it shares its maritime border with India. Now, why was it very famous? So if you look at the position of Sri Lanka in the map here, it has got a very strategic position in the Indian Ocean. All the ports around the Sri Lankan boundary, this boundary, can actually have a lot of potential to become a military base or to become a trading base because they control all the shipping routes that move in and around India till along to the Far East border and hence it was a very very famous trading port not just in India but all around the Europe and in the Far East. Far East means the Asia Pacific islands that we have Japan and beyond and as you can see here Sri Lanka only shares its maritime boundary with India. That's the closest it gets and a few and a little bit of boundary with the Maldives. All these colors in blue are actually maritime boundaries of these respective nations. Now let's move on back to uh, despite being a very very small nation state, Sri Lanka has a staggering number of rivers. It has 103 number of rivers or 103 rivers, a huge huge mangrove area approximately 700 square kilometers of mangrove area it is known for its fringing reefs on the coastal areas and estuarine sea grasses so these are very very famous ecological advantages of uh, sri lanka which have actually saved it from the 2004 tsunami that actually ravaged the entire tamil nadu coast now out of those 103 rivers the mahaveli river is the largest river of Sri Lanka. It is approximately 350 kilometers long. Sri Lanka has also been a founder of a lot of international organizations uh, commensurate with India. So it is the Commonwealth. Sri Lanka is also part of that non-aligned movement. Right after independence, Sri Lanka entered into non-aligned movement along with India and G77. So G77 is a very old grouping of nations, all the developing countries coming together to further their agenda to secure their place economically and socially in the uh, uh, United Nations Security Council and in the United Nations in general. So that he, it was a part of G77 and right now G77 has close to 103, 105 countries. But when it started off, it was a grouping of 77 countries of which Sri Lanka and India were founding members. I want you guys to actually go and look further about G77 as an organization. What is the importance of Sri Lanka? Can you look at the cartoon here? It says that when Sri Lanka was there, if Sri Lanka is to be sold, a lot of people around the world will actually line up to buy it. America will line up to buy it. China will line up to buy it. And so will India. And why is it so? Because of the very, very strategic position that Sri Lanka holds in the Indian Ocean. So first thing is, Sri Lanka's location is of extreme strategic geopolitical relevance to several major powers as you can see in the cartoon. The second example, the, uh, the very glaring example of its uh, economic or its strategic geopolitical relevance is that even in the past, the British after leaving Sri Lanka in 1948, they signed an external affairs agreement with Sri Lanka and they stayed put in Sri Lanka till 1956. It's only in 1956 that Sri Lanka gained some autonomy and it became a republic. It also has a maritime agreement with Russia since 1962. So since 1962, Russia had recognized the importance of Sri Lanka and Indian Ocean 
and they have a maritime agreement for support now if you look at the geography sri lanka is far north of sri, uh, far, uh, uh, russia is far north of sri lanka and still it has a maritime agreement with uh, sri lanka why because the indian ocean is a very very important ocean it's a very very important trade route and russia did not want to lose out on it so back in 1962 it had a maritime agreement with sri lanka despite not being in a direct maritime relationship with sri lanka so that's the importance of this island and of course the hamban tota port by built by the chinese very recently 2017 2016 china is also building the port city project or the colombo or it is developing the colombo port in sri lanka so i will also show you as we go where all china is building its infrastructure facilities in sri lanka we will discuss that in greater length so hamban tota port and the port city project in colombo are just two examples that china or sri lanka is building with the help of china or where chinese investments are there sri lanka also has a list of highly strategic ports located among the busiest sea lanes of communication i will show you what these highest highly strategic ports are so if you see the coastline of sri lanka these are some of the very very important ports that we have around sri lanka let's start with the port of colombo it's the largest port in sri lanka with the most traffic it is located on the southwestern side of sri lanka it has average of 335 vessels per month coming to it and it has four container terminals another terminal or the east container terminal is also coming up in sri lanka this is being built with the help of india and japan in sri lanka all right so it's a tripartite port that is being built in colombo and also there is a port city project going up in colombo with the help of china so both india and china are actually working in this port together now guys do you have any doubts so far G77 is actually about uh G77 is actually about developing countries coming together to fight for their rights in the United Nations that's what G77 is all about i hope i've answered your question good morning everybody i'm just seeing the messages right now so if you have any doubts please let me know all right okay the next is the important port of trikonomali trikonomali is the world's second largest natural harbor so it's already a very huge natural harbor the port is yet to be developed and india is taking a lot of interest in actually developing the port of trikonomali so if you can see it actually lies completely in the indian ocean surrounded by indian ocean here all right so it is farther away from the indian side it's on the northeastern side and this harbor is actually yet to be developed but it's a major port in sri lanka an average of 11 vessels per month actually come to trikomali and india is actually developing the port of trikomali then let's move on to the port of hamban tota it is the newest and one of the largest port in sri lanka average of 29 vessels per month actually come in hamban tota it has been developed by the chinese and recently it has been news that uh, sri lanka to allay india's concern has asked china to maintain hamban tota only as a trading port and not as a defense port right so that's a big win for india the port of kankensethurai is again a very new port that is on the northern borders in the north and eastern provinces where the tamil uh, majority is there this port is again being developed by india and the port point of pedro is again developed being developed by india these both are two very very minor ports but they are being developed by india because they lie in the tamil and minority regions but they're still under a lot of development now let's come to the complete south of sri lanka and then we have the port of gale if you're not able to read the small small letters it is okay i'm reading that out for you it's again a natural harbor so if you see the entire sri lankan coast is lined with a lot of natural harbors and it's a secondary port in sri lanka it is only used when the primary ports cannot handle the traffic and it has average of 6 vessels coming to it per month that's the current data let's move on back so as i told you sri lanka's colombo port is the largest port in sri lanka and it's the 25th busiest container port in the world and the natural deep water harbor that means what do we mean by natural deep water harbor that means large ships can actually come and dock in there the water is deep enough 
to support large ships to come in and that's why it's a huge container terminal. And Trikomali, as I've already told you, is the second largest natural harbour. What do we mean by natural harbour? That means you really do not need a lot of artificial machinery to actually develop the port or a lot of dredging is not required at the port. It's naturally deep for you to actually develop it as a port or as a seaport to conduct trade or defence ties at this port. In fact, in the ancient times or in the modern history of Sri Lanka, the port of Trikomali was the main base of the eastern fleet of the British Royal Navy. So during the Second World War, when British were still ruling Sri Lanka, they used to use it as a military base, the port of Trikomali. So it had importance back there in the modern history and it still has a lot of strategic importance. The Sri Lanka's location and with its ports can be used both for commercial and, and industrial purposes and also for military or defense bases. Now let's come to briefly about Sri Lanka's history. This will actually help us how Sri Lanka of today came into being, first thing. Second thing, what was India's role in making up of the current Sri Lanka? So Sri Lanka was a small island where Portuguese, so listen to the story. Back in 1505, that means in the 16th century somewhere, till then, Sri Lanka was a part of the Indian kingdom somewhere in the south. But come 16th century, Portuguese discovered at that point of time, the Vasco da Gama had also landed in India. So they, they were actually trying to explore. A lot of exploration was going on in the western world, right? So they decided, they had built the ship, so they decided to actually explore the uh, they decided to explore India and the Asian world, what lies there in the Asian world. So Portuguese or Almeida, as he is known, actually landed in the 16th century or the early 16th century in Sri Lanka. They landed in Colombo and they again, they again uh, since they were all explorers and soldiers together, so they gained control over the entire coastal area after building the port city in Colombo. So the Port city in Colombo is as old as the Portuguese rule. Once they build it, and if you are completely controlling the coastal areas of Sri Lanka, you are essentially controlling its entire foreign policy and its entire trade. So, the then king of Sri Lanka actually moved on to Kandy. Kandy is an interior location within the Sri Lankan island. So, he moved there just to save himself from the attacks of the Portuguese. At that point of time, the Dutch were also becoming very strong and they were also exploring a lot of nations. So, they had also come to Sri Lanka. So, King Rana, Raja Singhe II, then the king of Kandy, he decided that the good thing, because we can't actually fight with the uh, Portuguese army, we are very small in number and we are not a strong army, the Dutch can actually fight with the Portuguese. So, they signed a treaty with the Dutch to actually end the Portuguese rule in Sri Lanka and then they were expecting that after fighting the war, after uh, giving uh, independence to Sri Lanka from the Portuguese rule, the Dutch will also leave. But what instant happened was, after signing the treaty with the Dutch, the Dutch fought the Portuguese. But after throwing away the Portuguese from Sri Lanka, the Dutch took over control of the coastal regions of Sri Lanka. So again, starting from the Portuguese colonism, they ended with the Dutch colonism. And Dutch completely took over control in 1656. So, by 17th century, uh, Sri Lanka had been colonized from for, uh, by the Portuguese and now were being colonized by the Dutch. Now, far back in the Western world, Napoleonic war wars were going on. So, Napoleon Bonaparte of France was on his running spree to actually conquer the entire Europe. And those wars were fought between 1803 and and 1815, that means the 19th century, early 19th century. At that point of time, the Dutch were actually losing against the French. Everybody around the Europe was actually losing against Napoleon Bonaparte. His warrior credentials are very well known in the entire European world and in, in the entire world. So at that point of time, the Dutch were losing around all the territories to the French. So that at that point of time, British also if you look at the 18th century, the early 18th century, we had already lost West Bengal completely after the Battle of Buxar to British. So British were actually kind of had gained a complete control of India's finances and they were financially very strong. So they decided that if the Dutch lost on to Sri Lanka, 
to French, it is not very far that the French will also come for India. So, it is better that we go defeat the Dutch and gain control of Sri Lanka. So, that Sri Lanka stays on our side. So, British actually went, fought with the Dutch. British were already a very well-known navy by then. Fought with the Dutch and gained control of Sri Lanka in 1796. So, now if you see the trajectory, Sri Lanka went from Portuguese to the Dutch to the British for their own interest. So, it was being colonized completely and continuously. However, in 1815, the Battle of Waterloo happened where Napoleon Bonaparte finally met his nemesis and he lost the war. So, by 1815, the entire Sri Lanka then completely fell to the British and it was during that time also the second Kandian war was fought. So, the then king of Kandy, he tried to fight with British but he lost the war because by then, by 1815, British had become a very, very strong power both in India as well as around the world and they easily defeated the Sri Lankan. So, by 1815, Sri Lanka had completely lost its independence. The last kingdom was gone in Sri Lanka just like in 1857. India had completely become dependent on the British. India had completely lost its independence because even the last kingdoms had fallen to the British Empire. So, similarly, that happened a little bit sooner in Sri Lanka's history. And by 1815, entire Sri Lanka fell to British after the Second Kandyan War. It was after this time that tea and rubber plantations were introduced in early 20th century by the British. That is early 1990s. So, if you do a sync with India's history, it was during a similar time that when British gained con complete control over India in 1857, they started introducing the indigo plantations. And that is why the whole plantation thing became very, very uh, in uh, revival or in culture in both these countries, whether it be India or whether it be Sri Lanka. So, there they planted tree and rubber and coffee plantations and India, they started planting indigo to export to the rest of the world, right? And finally, in late 19th century, the Ceylon civil service was introduced. Just like the imperial civil service in India, they also had the Ceylon civil services in Sri Lanka. Now, what the civil services did to India, it did a similar thing in Sri Lanka. So, the new elite that came out of the imperial civil services, they were very modernist in, in their outlook. And they were a little above the caste and the religious ties that had been tying them earlier. Or they were far less influenced by the social evils. So, this was the modern community or a modern society that actually came over, which actually became very influential in the freedom struggles. As it was in India, that this modern community which came over actually recognized the importance of independence, recognized the social evils that, were facing, that we were facing in India. Similar modern society came over in Sri Lanka because of the Ceylon civil services, because people got educated in Western manners and Western etiquettes. So, they understood about a liberty, they understood about equality, right? So, then they, a new society also came up in Sri Lanka and they wanted similar things for Sri Lanka that were happening in the Western world. So, this gave a lot of impetus to the Sri Lankan freedom movement. Though the Sri Lankan freedom movement was not as severe or as complicated as India, there were some rebellions here and there, but largely Sri Lanka got its independence because British had to go and leave India after the Second World War. So, they were actually, they had no, um, uh, what do you say, no intentions to actually be in Sri Lanka because they had already lost their crown jewel, that is India, after the Second World War. And they did not have enough firepower to actually now control Sri Lanka also in the modern world, post the Second World War, where all the nations were getting free and independence was the new norm or giving equality to all the third world nations was the new norm and world move collectively towards a more peaceful situation. And the sun finally set down on the British Empire. Now, in between that, Sri Lanka had far greater constitutional reforms than India. So, first or the uh, important one being, in 1931 itself, because of the Donomore Commission, Sri Lanka gained universal adult franchise, which India only gained after independence when it was put in the constitution. And this commission is also very important because outside the white dominions of British Empire, that is Australia and other nations which were white dominions of the British Empire, this was the first uh, racial uh, nation, that is they, they actually consider us to be Asians. So outside the white dominions, Sri Lanka was the only place 
where British were actually practicing universal adult franchise or one person, one vote system. So that's why the Donomore Commission of 1931 is very, very important constitutional reform in the history of Sri Lanka. Then came the Solvari constitution reform, which actually gave Sri Lanka the dominion status in 1944, which roughly coincides with when we also actually got our dominion status. And finally, on 4th February 1948, Sri Lanka got independence. Now, uh, good morning. They use Sri Lankan rupiah. Right? Sri Lankan rupee. They use Sri Lankan rupee sattvic. Alright? Okay. Let's move on to the next thing. So, 1950s to present. So, what actually happened in Sri Lanka? What led to the civil war that actually pulled this entire nation back? So, listen to this very carefully because I'll be talking about Liberation Tamil Tigers of Ilam, after, about which you have been reading a lot in news. So, uh, the first Prime Minister was sworn in back in 1948. Before he could do anything, the second Prime Minister actually came in because there was a lot of instability going in Sri Lanka. So, SWRD Bandar Nayak actually was sworn in as the Prime Minister in 1956. He was an extremely pro-Sinhala Prime Minister. And that led to 1956 and 1958 anti-Tamil pogroms. What do we mean by a pogrom? So, it led to anti-Tamil riots. Similar thing what happened in Gujarat, the Gujarat riots. So, it led to a lot of riots between the Silhala majority and a Tamilan minority. And a lot of Tamilans were actually killed in those pogroms. Pogroms are religious cleaning. You kill the people with other religious leanings or other regional leanings. So, that is a pogrom. Post which came Sirimavo Bandar Nayak. He was the, she was the widow of Mr. Bandanaya. And in 1960s, by this time, the issue between Sinhala's majority and Tamilan minority had completely gone out of hand. Now, why were Sinhalis so against the Tamilans? Because Tamilans were the favourites of the British till the time they had colonised the country. So, they were given all sorts of reservations in the job. They were given all sorts of privileges, which were now completely taken away by the Tamil minority by the Sinhalese majority which was actually ruling the country. So, it created a lot of commotion in that small island country. Basically, British left Sri Lanka in the same manner as they left India. In India, they created animosity between the Hindus and the Muslims leading to the partition and creation of Pakistan. In Sri Lanka, they did a similar thing, created rift between the Sinhala majority and the Tamil minorities which had been cooperating till now and left the country in a state of civil war. However, thankfully for Sri Lanka, the country did not split up into a lot of provinces which the liberation tigers of Tabal Elam actually wanted that a separate eastern provinces dominated by the Tamil minorities but that didn't happen thankfully and Sri Lanka is still intact. But all these commotions that were happening between Sinhala and the Tamil minority gave rise to Tamil militancy because why? Why Tamil militancy came in? So, after a certain point of time, if you keep repressing a community, what will they do? They will actually resort to violent means to actually force on their agenda. Something which happened in India too. So, why did the revolutionaries come into power in India? When we were talking about the freedom struggle, why did we have the revolutionaries like Bhagat Singh, Rajguru and others? Because we couldn't achieve independence by peaceful norms. So, they thought it was better that we actually go for the violent norms and a similar thing happened and Tamil militancy came to rise by establishment of Lite as it is known in May 1976 by Velupalai Prabhakaran who remained its head till the end of the time when he was finally killed in 2009 by the Sri Lankan army and the civil war ended in 2009. Now, in 1977, J.R. Jay Vardhane actually came to power. He was a man with a head on its shoulders and he liberalized the Sri Lankan economy. So, Sri Lanka was the first economy in South Asia to be liberalized or to be made a free economy and connected with globalization. However, it was during his time only, J.R. Jay Vardhane's time only, he was a very forward looking leader, but yet during his time in 1983 July, Again, anti-Tamilan riots broke up and approximately 2.5k or 2,500 Tamilans were killed in one single day in July in 1983. It is also known as Black July in the history of Sri Lanka. 
all right so it was then jr jayawardhane thought the prime minister thought the situation is getting out of hand and we really need to include india to actually get their help in to get the help of india to get some sense of peace in the sri lankan territory why do you want to include india now let's come to india during this time during the entire 1970s to 1980s india was actually supporting the litte or the tamil militancy in sri lanka why because we have a state of tamil nadu which has close brotherly ties with sri lanka because of the religious cultural and historical ties and also the roti beti ka rishta so not just cultural or historic or religious ties but also a lot of marital relations were going on between tamil nadu and the sri lankan people with that tamil nadu was getting very very restless so tamil nadu along with it is suspected that our uh, research and intelligence wing raw was also involved in giving sri lanka or in giving the sri lankan tamilian militants a lot of aid to actually fight the sinhala's majority so india was a party in actually flaring up the tamil militancy in sri lanka with that finally jayawardhane came to his senses he approached rajiv gandhi in 1987 and said that look the way it is happening it is only furthering the militancy in sri lanka and if sri lanka is not at peace india cannot remain at peace why because tamil nadu always cared about a lot what was happening in sri lanka and it actually disturbed the politics at the center so that was one region and the second region is that the litte or liberation tamil tigers uh, liberation tigers of tamil nadu they wanted a separate eastern province of tamilans they are dominated by the tamilans so if something like that actually happens this will see a mass exodus of tamil people from tamil nadu also going to stay with the litte now that means it was a threat to india's internal security and integrity and that's when india woke up and said okay fine we'll actually go and help sri lanka and that's when india and sri lanka signed the peace accord in 1987 between rajiv gandhi and the prime minister of sri lanka jr jayawardhane according to that peace accord sri lanka said sri lanka would be given two things so sri lanka said we'll actually become quasi federal or the 13th amendment as it came out to be known that we will give the provinces some of the powers and we will become quasi federal and also the litte will give away its arms and it will become a peaceful negotiator and india what will india do india will no more interfere in internal affairs of sri lanka so india was there as a party to this peace accord to basically negotiate between the litte and the sri lankan government however in all that they actually forgot interestingly to take litte on board and to take their uh, agreement to this entire peace accord and that's why when the indian peacekeeping forces were sent to sri lanka they came into direct conflict with the litte which led to a loss of life of 1000 soldiers in sri lanka and after that obviously indian uh, army supposed to have committed some war crimes in sri lanka and they were hated for it so unlike what happened in bangladesh when uh, prime minister indira gandhi was at helm and indian army was uh, cheered so much in bangladesh for getting its independence in sri lanka indian army was hated and we had to completely withdraw in 1989 and we had to actually take a pledge that we will never again interfere in any of the domestic uh, matters of our neighbors and obviously we also lost the life of our dear and beloved prime minister rajiv gandhi in 1989 he was assassinated by some of the tamil militants only now then comes in 2002 so as we know the peace accord between sri lanka and litte completely failed we actually ruined it by not taking the litte on board but why was litte not coming on board so when the india peace sri lanka accord was being signed so there was not just one tamilan militant outfit there were others apart from the litte but the litte was the very significant one so all the other tamilan militants had actually agreed to be a part of the accord but litte was never asked whether it wanted to be a part of the accord or whether it was okay with the conditions so when the representation was being made from the tamilan side indian sent some of its candidates 
so they selected all those candidates from the other tamilan militant uh, groups and not from litte litte did not like it it said that if we are to come and negotiate then we should send our representatives which was rejected by india and that's why india army and litte actually came into direct conflict and that is what resulted in india's failure as a indian peacekeeping force in sri lanka however after that 18 uh, 1987 peace accord failed in 2002 norway actually mediated a ceasefire agreement between the government of sri lanka and litte or the liberation tigers of tamil nadu then between 1985 to 2006 sri lankan government and tamil insurgents or the litte actually sat for four rounds of peace talks but nothing came out of it till 2006 so finally when nothing was working the government decided the sri lankan the government decided that it's our domestic affair and we really need to handle it now it's enough so both litte and government actually resumed fighting in 2006 and though they reached a ceasefire agreement in 2002 the government completely backed out from the ceasefire in 2008 and it resumed full fighting force and by 2009 when there was the newspaper full of this history that finally they had killed velupillai prabhakaran under the presidency of mahinda rajapaksa who is currently the prime minister now and the president is his uh, brother gotabaya rajapaksa the current president is gotabaya rajapaksa who is the pm's uh, brother so under the presidency of mahinda rajapaksa litte was finally eliminated and finally the civil war ended in 2009 and now sri lanka is in a very very peaceful domestic state so after this entire thing ended in 2009 there was a problem what was the problem whenever there is a war whenever a country is at a war with its own people whenever there is a civil war like situation a lot of atrocities are committed on your own people right so the united nations and all the other countries in the world they wanted sri lanka to look into the war time atrocities committed on the tamilan people because the tamilan people actually made the issue international and obviously india had interest in it because the tamil nadu government it has very close ties with tamilan people and uh, obviously the tamil nadu government at that time ruled by both the jay lalita for some time and by karunanidhi for some time the tamil nadu uh, the sri lankan issue was very very hot so they both used to force the indian government to go and take this issue of committing of war time atrocities on tamil to the international level so though india voted against sri lanka in 2009 2012 and 2013 against the uh, war time atrocities it committed and it was with sri lanka india finally gave into pressure and it had to actually ask sri lanka that what it was doing to inquire, inquire into the uh, crimes committed against the tamilans during the insurgency or during the civil war why did we actually want to do that because during that insurgency or during that civil war that was going on when the government of the uh, sri lanka and the litte were fighting a lot of tamilans actually disappeared a lot of people disappeared a lot of people were killed a lot of people were displayed uh, displaced so as per the humanitarian guidance of the un and of the all the other democratic western nations Sri Lanka was supposed to finally rehabilitate the displaced persons and also find the mis- uh, the people who were missing and till now a lot of tamilan peoples are missing so finally in may 2010 president rajapaksa decided to appoint a lessons learned and reconciliation commission what was this commission supposed to do it was supposed to assess the conflict between the time of the ceasefire agreement that is 2002 and the final defeat of litte in 2009 so what were the lessons learned that how not to do a war against your own people and to find all the missing people and to finally rehabilitate them and form a unified sri lanka so the issue that was going on between sri lanka and india after this lessons learned and reconciliation commission was set up was that india should not meddle with the domestic affairs of sri lanka india should support a united sri lanka and should not support tamilan minority and india should let sri lanka decide how it wants to rehabilitate its own people right at that point of time the refugee crisis a lot of tamilans were actually traveling to india 
to seek political asylum after the litte war ended so then india said that if you cannot control the refugee crisis then we have no other choice but to actually intervene in your domestic politics and to tell you that please rehabilitate these people again and maintain peace within your territory with that let's come to india sri lanka relations history so much of it i've already talked about that in ancient times buddhism was actually introduced in sri lanka okay any more doubts folks no doubt so far everything clear i'll take a pause here anything that you want to understand anything that is not clear please post it in the live chat i will answer your queries if there are any and then we'll move further all right so ancient times i've already told you we have relationships because buddhism was spread by emperor ashoka in 4th century bc by sending his son and his daughter to sri lanka and sending them with the sapling of the bodhi tree 1970s to 1980s i've already explained that how india was actually involved in supporting the litte and then finally came to its senses that if it supported litte any further it could actually lead to a disintegration of the indian nation itself and led to the sending of the india peace accord of 1987 or the 13th amendment accord of 1987 and finally withdrawing the indian peacekeeping forces because they were becoming very very unpopular and uh they were being hated by the sri lankan people so finally we had to withdraw the indian peacekeeping force leading to the assassination of rajiv gandhi in 1989 and finally we declared litte a terrorist out of it back in 1992 only and in 2009 litte was completely eliminated yes yes there are so there are a lot of non hindu migrants in tamil refugees i will talk about them there are non hindu uh, migrants in tamil refugees i will talk about them when i'll be talking about the people community ties we have with sri lanka all right okay trade and economy so what are we'll finally discuss areas of cooperation with sri lanka and then we'll discuss the areas of concern with sri lanka so let's move on sri lanka is one of india's largest trade partners among the sarc countries that means among the south asian nations sri lanka is one of our largest trading partners so it's not pakistan it's not nepal it's sri lanka which is our largest trading partners and india in turn is sri lanka's largest trading partner globally not just among sarc but globally india exports a lot of things to sri lanka the trade between two countries has actually grown rapidly after the india sri lanka free trade agreement which was signed in 2000 and here in the india sri lanka free trade agreement india actually acted as a big brother and did not expect any sort of reciprocity so india agreed to open more tariff lines towards sri lanka in 3 years and sri lanka was given a time of 8 years to actually open up its economy to indian goods so we acted on a very very cooperative manner with a small island neighbor that's what led to the success of the india sri lanka free trade agreement and since 2000 trade has only grown by leaps and bounds between india and sri lanka almost to the rise of 200% before so before march 2000 if the trade was x% percent, it has grown by 200% percent after the india uh, sri lanka free trade agreement has been signed So where do we actually invest in Sri Lanka? So Indian investments in Sri Lanka are in petroleum, retail, IT, financial services, real estate, telecommunication, hospitality and tourism, banking and food processing. So almost every other industry in Sri Lanka is somewhere being run by the Indian investment. So we have huge investments in Sri Lanka. And again, the most important link that we have with Sri Lanka is the tourism. Every fifth tourist in Sri Lanka is an Indian. So India is the largest contributor to Sri Lankan tourism connectivity so uh, abdul i will actually talk about your doubt when i am talking about the people to people ties that we have with sri lanka so i will just answer your question shortly all right connectivity so we were actually trying to launch a setu samundram shipping canal project with sri lanka so india is neither connected by land nor by rail to sri lanka but we are connected by water and we are also connected by airplanes or flights to sri lanka 
However, we wanted to try a shipping canal project or the Setu Samandam project which was quite in news between India and Sri Lanka. What did we want to do in there? So we actually wanted to dredge out this entire uh, coastal area which is there between India and Sri Lanka. So this area along the Ram Setu which is it is also called the Ram Setu and this area nearby the Indian and the Sri Lankan coast it is actually a very very shallow area. So you really can't run big ships here. So India said that we will actually dredge out or remove the sand from this area, deepen the ocean waters here and then create a canal. So why do we want to create a canal here? Because once you create the canal, instead of actually going all around the Sri Lankan way to actually move your way to the ports of Kolkata and further east, you can, after making the canal, the big ships can directly pass from this channel along the Park Strait and go to the eastern borders of India. Now, even today, when India has to transport something from the western coast to the eastern coast, it has to go all around the Sri Lankan island. But if this Sevutu Samundram project could have gone up, that would have significantly reduced the time and kilometers that the ships needed to travel to go from one coast of India to the another. And also, it would have been a very, very important, significant sea route in the Indian Ocean. However, what happened with that was, so this Setu Samundra project was actually somewhat influencing the limestone shoals of Adams Bridge, also known as Rama Setu, which is considered to be the Setu that has been built by Rama when he was trying to go to Sri Lanka to rescue Sita. Now, this time they said that if we actually dredge the sea in between Tamil Nadu and Sri Lanka, we might actually completely destroy the limestone shoals. So, when it is made of limestone, these shoals are already very, very ecologically sensitive. And not just that, even a small disturbance near about these areas can actually lead to the breakage of limestone shoals. So, limestone is very, very soft. So, that's why there was a lot of ecological concerns around this. So, though this entire canal project was conceived way back in 1860s by British Alfred Dundas Taylor, it only received approval by the Indian government in 2005. However, after the intervention of the Supreme Court and a lot of Hindu pressure groups saying that we don't want the Ram Setu to be disturbed in any way, India has finally decided to redact itself and it has decided to completely uh, switch off the project in 2018 and declared that no, if we actually go through this project, it might impact the Rama Setu and we don't want to hurt people's sentiments. So we will not go ahead with this connectivity project or the Setu Samundram shipping canal project. Alright, I'll talk about that. Uh, maybe I'll talk about that in the next session because I haven't covered CAA here. Alright? Okay. Next comes the developmental assistance. So, India is actually... Uh, Sri Lanka is one of our largest credit receivers of India. All right. So India, India's overall commitment to Sri Lanka actually stands at close to US dollar 3 billion, out of which around 560 million are only granted as grants. That means uh, Sri Lanka does not have to pay any interest on it. It has just been given as a grant with free of interest. So they can directly use it for their benefit. The second development assistance, the biggest development assistance that we are giving them is building up of 50,000 houses for the state workers of Sri Lanka, which are Tamil minority regions in the plantation areas and other houses. So, out of which we have actually completed 46,000 houses in the northern and the eastern provinces. The remaining 4,000 houses are still to be completed because they are in difficult terrain areas. So only 2,000 houses have been completed so now in 2018 and the rest are in different stages of completion. So it is one of India's largest, largest projects outside India with a commitment of almost 1,300 crore rupees in grants. And India has done it quite successfully. So this is an aerial view of the houses that have been built by India in the estate regions or in the hilly regions of uh, Sri Lanka for the tea estate or the other rubber estate workers. In the defense cooperation, Sri Lanka and New Delhi have a long, long history of security cooperation. That means 
India and Sri Lanka already conduct joint military exercises known as Mitra Shakti and naval exercises known as Slinex in the Indian Ocean. India also provides defense training to various uh, Sri Lankan forces and there is a trilateral maritime security arrangement between India, Sri Lanka and the Maldives to improve surveillance, anti-piracy operations and reduce maritime pollution in the Indian Ocean region. As of April 2019, India and Sri Lanka also conducted an agreement on countering drug trafficking and human trafficking. So just like Nepal, drug trafficking and human trafficking is very very rampant across the India-Sri Lankan border. So if you remember the movie Chennai Express where actually uh, Shah Rukh Khan landed on a Sri Lankan ship or in Sri Lankan waters, international waters. So they actually think him to be a drug trafficker or a fisherman that has inadvertently crossed into the Sri Lankan waters and he was apprehended by the Sri Lankan police. So a similar thing keeps happening all around the year and we are actually trying, India and Sri Lanka are together trying to counter the drug or the human trafficking that goes around in the Indian Sri Lankan borders. And back in 2010, India and Sri Lanka signed an agreement to return their prisoners. So if there are some, we take some of the Sri Lankans as prisoners or if they take some of the Indians as prisoners, the prisoners are supposed to complete their remaining prison term in the respective native countries. That means if Sri Lanka has some Indian prisoners, they will send it back to India and those uh, prisoners who were there in uh, Sri Lanka, Indian prisoners in Sri Lanka, they can complete the rest of their terms in the Indian prisons. And off late, this has actually been going on very well. And this has helped same, uh, save some of the bad blood that was there between India and Sri Lanka. And a lot of people, sentenced people from Kerala and Tamil Nadu have been returned back by Sri Lanka to India under this agreement. The cultural ties between the two nations. So the cultural ties between the two nations goes back far in 1977 during the time of J.R. Jayawardhane. And we signed the agreement for periodic cultural exchange programs between the two countries and it still goes on. Also, Indian Cultural Centre in Colombo is actively promoting awareness of Indian culture. So, it actually offers classes in Indian music, dance, Hindi and yoga. In fact, the International Day of Yoga is every year celebrated in Sri Lanka with similar pomp and glory as it is celebrated in India. And India and Sri Lanka, so as I talked about the Vesak, that is Lord Buddha's 2600th year. It was celebrated with a lot of fanfare by both India and Sri Lanka. However, Nepal actually decided to celebrate it alone by actually um, taking the entire glory of Buddha's birth and saying that uh, Nepal is the only fountainhead of Buddhism. So India got very enraged by that and India did not celebrate it with Nepal as it has been doing it for a lot of years. But India decided instead to celebrate it with Sri Lanka. And the two governments also celebrated the 150th anniversary of Anargika Dharampal. He is a very well-known poet of Sri Lankan origin who, write, uh, who wrote a lot about Indo-Sri Lankan unity or Indo-Sri Lankan commonness. And they celebrated his 150th anniversary in 2014. Another one is the India-Sri Lankan Foundation which was set up in December 1998 as an intergovernmental initiative for social Society, civil society exchanges and enhancing contact between the younger generation of the two countries. But the most important cultural ties that we have, cultural educational ties we have is with respect to the Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation Scheme and the Colombo Plan. These two are actually technical training sessions which we provide to people of other developing nations. So almost 40 other developing nations have provided technical training under these two programs which is run by the Ministry of External Affairs. And India offers 370 slots annually to Sri Lankan nationals to come to India, get trained in various courses around universities in India. In fact, India used to offer and that program, the Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation Scheme and the Colombo Plan actually started way back in the times of Nehru in 1964 and it is still continuing and now India offers almost 10,000 slots to all the developing countries and a lot of Sri Lankan nationals or African nationals actually come to India to gain a lot of training. So that's India's human resource or human resource development cloud all around the Indian subcontinent. So you can actually essentially remember these two schemes, they are very very important and study further about them. 
I have already sent you the link of the Ministry of External Affairs regarding a PDF to the ITEC and the Colombo plan. It's already there in the live chat, the top link. It's already uh, at the top of the live chat. So you can directly access the link from there. Also, Government of India formally launched the e-tourist visa scheme for the Sri Lankan nationals in 2015 and has also reduced as a goodwill gesture the fee visa fee for the tourism uh, or e-tourism visas fee for the Sri Lankan nationals so that they can easily come and visit India. Now, Abdul, I'm answering your question here that what are the other Indian communities that are there? So, when we talk about them, apart from the Tamil uh, speaking population, the other people of Indian origin in Sri Lanka are the Sindhis, the Bohras who are non-Hindus, Gujaratis, Memins again non-Hindus, Parsis, non-Hindus, Malayalis and Telugu speaking people who have settled down in Sri Lanka, all right, and they are engaged in various business ventures. So though they are a lot of minority, Tamilans are the majority when it compares to or when you are comparing all the minorities together. So Tamilans are a majority amongst the people of Indian origin who have settled in Sri Lanka. But these other people are doing extremely well and they are very well economically prosperous and well placed in Sri Lanka. So a fair number of Indian origin Tamils also live in Colombo and are engaged in business. And according to government census figures of 2011, the population of Indian origin Tamils in Sri Lanka is approximately 1.6 million. Let's come on to the multilateral partnership. You are welcome, Abdul. So, India and Sri Lanka share multiple multilateral forums such as the BIMSTEC, the Bay of Bengal uh, Initiative for Multisectoral Technical and Economic Cooperation, the NAM or the Non-Aligned Movement and SAR. Both India and Sri Lanka have been the founder members of these three initiatives or four initiatives including the G77. Now, there I want to mention a very, very important thing about the political exchanges about which I will be talking in the way forward section. Now, interestingly, this is the most interesting part of our today's session, the areas of dispute between India and Sri Lanka. So, that is the fishing dispute. I have showed you two cartoons here. One is at the international level, the Indo-Lanka fishermen's crisis still is still unresolved. The fishing dispute is still unresolved. And the other, Jalalita is no more in polity now and so is Karunanadi. But the fishing issue was actually a big political issue in the Tamil Nadu area. And it was used, as, used to score political points between Jalalita and Karunanadi one by one whenever their governments came into power. So sometimes it was the AIDMK. And sometimes it was the DMK which actually keeps coming into power in Tamil Nadu. And they have actually brought to forefront the Indo-Lanka fishermen's issue. And have actually forced the central Indian government to actually act upon it and take the issue bilaterally with Sri Lanka. Now let's study this issue a little bit more in detail. So if you know, we know on one side, the civil war was going on in Sri Lanka from 1970s, early 1970s till 2009. So that means the Sri Lankan fishermen did not have access to the Jaffna Peninsula or the northern area of Sri Lanka about which I already discussed because of the war going on there, the civil war going on there, right? Now, however, in 1960s in India, India decided to promote seafood exports and they started offering huge subsidies to the fishermen. So, the sea between India and Sri Lanka is very rich in fish and since the Sri Lankans were not accessing it or the Sri Lankan Tamils were not accessing it due to the presence of Litte in the Zafna Peninsula, so the sea was actually completely left for the Indian fishermen to go and explore. And at that point of time back in 1960s, the maritime border between India and Sri Lanka was not decided. So as a result of this, the Tamil Nadu fishermen actually capitalized on the world's rising seafood demand and they started going to the Sri Lankan waters to go and fish for a uh, lot of fisheries and lot of seafood. With that happening, finally in 1970s, during the time of Indira Gandhi, Sri Lanka and India both decided that they need to settle their maritime borders. Now, why do you need to settle the maritime borders or any borders at all? Because if India has to build its position in the world, we at least should not have any undisputed or unresolved border issues with our neighboring nations. 
So we decided to actually go and sign the International Maritime Border Agreement with Sri Lanka both in 1970s and uh, in 1972 and 1974 during the time of Prime Minister Nindra Gandhi and finally we offered the island of Kacha Tibu to the Sri Lanka and we said that you take this island as a gift so the entire boundary dispute or maritime boundary dispute was resolved with Sri Lanka there and then in 1974. Now what happens with Indians is so since that time in 1960s till now Indians actually got into a habit of actually straying on in the international waters and going on to the Sri Lankan maritime waters and fish there because a lot of fish are there and it's a very very good uh, fishing ground and uh, the other reason is that the maritime boundary between India and Sri Lanka is so small that you often do not realize when you have come into the international waters and crossed over to the Sri Lankan boundary. So initially Sri Lanka was okay it kept on complaining to India that your uh, fishermen keep coming to our territory and start fishing here which is actually not very helpful for our fishing communities our own fishing communities and they are losing out economically but India did not pay much heed suppose that the Sri Lankan Navy actually became very very alert and they started shooting Indian fishermen and that's when this actual dispute of fishing came into a lot of limelight and the central government of India decided to intervene. Now, what is the issue with the Sri Lankan fishermen and how this actually happened? So, till 2009, the Tamil Nadu fishermen were having a free reign in the in Sri Lankan international waters. But once the fishermen started returning after the civil war ended, both these fishermen started getting into fights in the international waters that is there between Indian, uh, the Indian uh, maritime boundary and the Sri Lankan maritime boundary. Now, Indian fishermen, since they had years of experience, they used to bring mechanized trawlers with them to actually trawl for fish. Now, what are mechanized trawlers? They are large ships attached with fishing nets so that they can actually ship fish from deep into the ocean and they could, uh, they used to take that fish catch away from the uh, fishermen of Sri Lanka. So, that was actually economically ruining the fishermen of Sri Lanka. With that happening, the fishermen, uh, the fishermen of Sri Lanka started complaining that we do traditional fishing. So, we are not able to catch as much fish as the Indians. And also, they by using their mechanized trawlers are not only destroying the ecology of the Sri Lankan waters, they are also taking a majority of the fish catch away with them. And Indian problem was that since we had gifted Kacha Tivu to Sri Lankans where the, our Indian fishermen used to go and take rest and sort their fishes out, the Indian fishermen had no option but to actually go into the Sri Lankan waters to go and catch their fish because there was not enough catch available in the Indian waters. So, this created a lot of rift. Additionally, during the same time in 1983, the Tamil Nadu actually enacted an act called Tamil Nadu Fisheries Regulation Act which meant that the fishermen who were using mechanized trawlers cannot use their trawlers within 3 nautical miles of the Indian maritime boundary. They had to go further and fish there. Now, they did not find many fish there because we had actually been fishing ruthlessly in that area and now there was an increased competition with the Tamilian fishermen from Sri Lankan also coming in or the Sri Lankan fishermen also coming in. So, they could not catch enough fish. So, they decided to actually instead of coming back empty-handed, they decided to go further into the Sri Lankan waters and decided to fish there. Now, Sri Lankan army being very alert, they started shooting up the Indian fishermen. So, that created a lot of rift. And at that point of time when it was all happening, between 2009 and 2011 or till 2014, it was the UPA government in power. Now, the UPA government was a coalition government and it had a strong support from the Tamil Nadu government. So, the Tamil Nadu government kept forcing India to actually go and talk to the Sri Lankan counterparts to actually stop all these shootings and to settle this dispute bilaterally. Now, here there is an important point which I want you to take notice that how regional politics by the formation of coalition governments can actually give states a very very high say in the bilateral agreements that we have between the nations or in international polity. So, Tamil Nadu was kind of influencing our entire foreign policy towards Sri Lanka at that point of time between 2009 till 2014 during which time the maritime dispute was at its high regarding the fisheries. So, 
This is the Kachatibu Island. It is off the coast of Rameshwaram, lying uh, right to the point of Rameshwaram. It's a very, very small island, which was earlier with India, but India finally gifted it to Sri Lanka. And hence, we don't have any maritime dispute with Sri Lanka. We only have a fisheries dispute with Sri Lanka. And this is the Gulf of Manar. This is the Manar Island. Okay, this is the Pamban Island. And this is the Park Strait. This entire path is the Park Strait. Okay. Finally, what has happened is India and Sri Lanka had agreed to set up a joint working group on fisheries between the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmer Welfare in India and Ministry of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources Development of Sri Lanka to find a permanent solution to the fisherman issue, which hasn't happened till now. Now, area of dispute two on two, that is Sri Lanka's deemed closeness with China. So, it is a, actually a common refrain in India's re relations with the entire Indian subcontinent that all these smaller neighbors are going to the other bigger neighbor in the Indian uh, region or in the Asian region that is China. So, we discussed Nepal's deemed closeness with China. So, now we'll be discussing Sri Lanka's deemed closeness with China and how it is an irritant in India-Sri Lankan relationship. So, as you can see, Nepal has put uh, sorry, Sri Lanka has put Nip uh, India on the edge and now Sri uh, China is actually using it to manipulate the relations between India and Sri Lanka or to manipulate India into giving in. This is a map actually showing Indian and Sri Lankan presence in the entire Sri Lankan area. I will talk about it, this map a little bit more in detail as we progress. And this picture is actually about a new kind of string of pearls. So this is a new interpretation of string of pearls. Apart from building, apart from China building, a lot of naval bases in the entire Indian Oceans to actually cover or to monitor India's activities in the naval regions, it is said that there might be another string of pearls because China is getting into a friendly nexus with Pakistan and Sri Lanka. So this entire triangle becomes influence of China and it is called a second string of pearls theory with India, sorry, with China, Pakistan and Sri Lanka access coming up to contain the entire region of India from all the sides, from the south, from the east and from the west, west Pakistan, south Sri Lanka and north China. With that, let's go into a little bit more detail. Why Sri Lanka is actually moving a lot towards China? So we all know China has a lot of economic clout and political clout, all right? And India cannot provide as much in assistance or an in infrastructure as the Chinese can provide. So China has actually extended billions of dollars of loans to Sri Lankan government for new infrastructure projects, which is actually not good for India's strategic depth in the Indian Ocean region. Why? Because whoever invests into an economy, they actually get a bigger pie or a bigger share of their interest being taken care of by that respective government, which is receiving the aid. Now. When that is actually happening, it puts Sri Lanka directly into the lap of China, which is not taken very well by India. But India could not actually extend billions of dollars of loan to Sri Lanka. Now, why did Sri Lankan government actually require billions of dollars of loans? Because Sri Lanka had just come out of the civil war in 2009 and it did not have enough resources for its development. So definitely it required that kind of money. China had that kind of money, so it provided easily to the Sri Lankan government. We also extended some credit lines. But we could not actually uh, build the Sri Lankan infrastructure in a way Chinese could. So that's why Sri Lankan uh, government took billions of dollars of loans from the Chinese government. Sri Lanka also strat uh, handed over the strategic port of Hambandota to China on a 99-year lease. So the CHSE or the Chinese Harbour uh, Agency is actually developing the Hambantota port. And this Hambantota port is also part of the Belt and Road Initiative that is being built by China, to which India is also not a party. So that is again a major irritant in India-Sri Lankan relations. Yes, Belt and Road Initiative of China or the Maritime Silk Route of China. So the road here stands for the Maritime Silk Route. 
and the belt here stands for the road and the railways that China is building in different areas as a part of the ancient Silk Road on the road and the land. Is it clear now? However, Sri Lankans themselves, the, the, the domestic people of Sri Lankan or the native Sri Lankans themselves have actually opposed Sri Lanka's move to give China more hegemony in Sri Lanka or to actually go ahead with the port deal. They have actually thought it to be a sellout of their national assets to China. So even Sri Lankans do not really like China, even when it is supplying them with huge arms and ammunition sale and huge loans to actually develop the Sri Lankan infrastructure. With that, let's understand China-Sri Lankan axis and its implications for India. So I have given this heading as Sri Lanka playing Russian roulette. Now, if you see, in the northern part of Sri Lanka, there is a presence of lot of Indian flags. What does that mean? These are the areas being developed by Indian aid. In the southern areas, you see a lot of Chinese flags. These are the areas which are being developed by the Chinese. So, can you see, Sri Lanka is playing both the neighbors against each other to gain maximum investments for itself. So, in the no northern region, in Sampur, our NTPC or National Thermal Power Corporation is developing a 500 megawatt projects thermal power project in Sampur, which lies in the eastern coast of Sri Lanka. We are also building the Palai Civilian Airport in the Zafna Peninsula. This region is called the Zafna Peninsula, which was earlier occupied by the Litte. We are also developing the Kankin Sudharai port. It is a mini port right now. We are trying to develop it into a major port. So that is being done with the help of India. And obviously we already have a northern housing project about which I talked that we are building 50,000 houses in the northern and the eastern provinces for the Tamilian minorities or the Tamilian estate workers. Let's move on to the south. Tamil, uh, China is building the Matala airport in Sri Lanka. It has been given the 99 year lease already for the Hamantota port project. China is also developing the Colombo port city project and the Lotus Towers in Sri Lanka, which indicates a rich Buddhist heritage for Sri Lanka. It is also developing the Norocholai port in Sri Lanka. So can you see at different levels, Sri Lanka is using the aid both from India and Sri Lanka to develop its own regional power, to develop its own infrastructure. So that India and China should both understand that they are only playing against each other by this small neighbor. So you can see Sri Lanka is very astutely playing in the neighborhood or using the India-China sentiments against each other to its own advantage. Now, however, how is Sri Lanka ailing India's concern and why is India... Why is India ailing Sri? Why is Sri Lanka ailing India's concern? So you will be surprised to know that once China got the Hamantota port, they decided to completely conquer it because Sri Lanka was unable to pay the debt for the Hamantota port, and that actually sent shockwaves around Sri Lanka. So then Sri Lanka again came back running to India and said that you were right. We should actually, you know, uh, keep you in the loop, and we will have better relations with you. So then in 2015. Sri Lanka and India signed their first civil nuclear partnership agreement. All right. So, and also Sri Lanka had asked China that we will pay the debt, but you will not use Hamantota port as a defense base. You can only use it as a trading base. So by both doing both these, Sri Lanka has allayed the concerns of India. Also, India is rebuilding or planning to rebuild the Trikomali port, as I've already mentioned, to counterweight the Chinese development at Hamantota. And India, Japan together are also developing an east container terminal at the Colombo port to counter the Chinese influence at the Colombo port. This is a very, very recent happening, which has happened in 2019. With that, we will move on to the way forward. So have you guys understood till now what is happening between India, China, what is happening between India, China, Sri Lanka? How is the access currently working out? Right? Is everything understood till now? Any doubts so far? 
Apart from the CAA doubt, Abdul, I will answer your question in the next session. Any doubts till now? Okay, we will move ahead with the way forward. So, how should we actually handle the India-Sri Lanka visit? So, as I was talking about it, uh, we have a lot of high-level political exchanges between India and Sri Lanka. So, back in 2014, when our Prime Minister was sworn in, so the Sark nations were called in for the swearing-in ceremony. So, definitely Sri Lanka came in. All right. So, that was the first official visit. And after Sri Lanka's newly elected President Maithri uh, Pal Sri Sena uh, took power in 2015, he made his first official visit to India, indicating that India is an important partner. And then Modi actually returned the favor by doing a standalone visit to Sri Lanka, the first by an Indian Prime Minister in 28 years to actually cement India-Sri Lankan ties. And further, then again, when the Modi government was sworn in for a second time in 2019, India invited all the BIMSTEC leaders to the swearing-in ceremony. So again, Sri Lanka was the first one to be invited. And that was actually a very symbolic gesture cementing further the India-Sri Lankan ties, all right? Again, since both the countries are having a democratic setup, as I have told repeatedly, that the political system which the two nations are running is a very important determinant in the ties or in the friendly ties that can happen between the two nations. So, since both the countries are democracies, there's a lot of scope for broadening and deepening the Sri Lankan ties further than what they already are. With that, both the countries are already trying to work out a permanent uh, issue to permanently settle the issue of fishermen through bilateral engagements. Also, we were actually about to sign the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement to improve the economic cooperation between both the countries, but it hasn't been signed till now and then the coronavirus crisis set in. So once this gets over, India and China, uh, India and Sri Lanka should work together to actually sign this Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, which gives both the partners a lot more economic clout in each other's economy. The trade will increase manifold and along with the human resources that can be transferred to each other's territories. And India definitely needs to focus more on the traditional and cultural ties which it has with Sri Lanka to improve its ties in the other regions with Sri Lanka. So, starting off ferry services or boat services between India and Sri Lanka can obviously improve people-to-people -people linkages. So, since we do not have a land or rail corridor with Sri Lanka, we can definitely start boat services between India and Sri Lanka to actually have a lot more people-to-people -people mingling. And finally, mutual recognition of each other's concerns and interests will actually help us go a lot way in forward. We have done that to a certain extent, recognizing that if we play into the hands of China, it is not beneficial to either of the economies. It is important that we recognize the ties we have had, uh, had since the ancient times and to further strengthen them for each other's development rather than selling out our assets to a third Asian neighbor, which is very, very aggressive and which is not friendly to either of the economies. With that, I will end today's session. So, are there any doubts that needs to be addressed? I will answer them. And I will also share with you my telegram group link for current affairs. This is the group link where you can directly interact with me. And this is the telegram channel link. So, you can join whichever one you want to join. At both the places, I post all my upcoming sessions, both on YouTube and on Unacademy. On Unacademy, I am taking special classes right now on the prelims mock test series. All right. It is getting a very good response. It will actually help you learn the tips and tricks to solve your prelims papers. And it's a current affairs series. So, your entire current affairs will be revised. I'll be taking more than 15 sessions in July only. And we have just completed with two sessions yesterday. So, it's a very brilliant series. It is free for all. So, anybody who can access the Unacademy website. So, you do not have to take an Unacademy subscription for it. You can simply log into the Unacademy website and take my prelims mock test series, which I'll be running for the entire July on the Unacademy platform. So, come there. It's a wonderful experience to do the test series live with your educator already on the other side so that I can completely explain you each and every question. Till late, till now, we have been doing uh, the prelims mock test series alone. Students do it alone. They solve the questions and they look at the answers. Here, 
I will make you solve the mock test series one by one with me. After each and every question, I will give you a detailed explanation on how to solve the prelims test. All right. So it's a very, very interactive series. And I take it on alternative days at 8.30 p.m. To mo know more about the series, you can actually uh, follow me on Unacademy. On the Unacademy app or on the Unacademy app, uh, sorry, website, you can follow me so that you get direct notifications from whenever I'm conducting these prelims mock test series. Also, uh, you can join me on the Telegram channel or the Telegram group because at both these places also, I post all about my sessions, whether on Unacademy or on the YouTube. With that, I hope you have liked the sessions. So please subscribe to our channel. Uh, let's crack UPSC CSE in English or UPSC English channel of Unacademy for more updates from my side and hit the bell icon for more, more, more notifications on my videos. And use my code SBUS to get an instant 10% discount on all your Unacademy subscriptions under the UPSC CSE category. All right, which reduces your fee to less than 30, 40,000 for one year and less than 30,000 for two years if you use my code SBUS. With that, I will end today's session. But before that, I'll look for if there are any doubts. In Tamil, so see, Abdul, what is happening is the migrants are going back from India to Sri Lanka and from Sri Lanka to India. So I cannot mention each and every uh, community. It is a little bit difficult to mention each and every one of them. So I took the names of some of the communities. So obviously, the people of Indian origin that are residing in Tamil Nadu, they'll be the same ones which will actually be coming back as refugees in India or going back from India to uh, Sri Lanka back. So when the Tamil refugees actually started pouring in after the civil war ended or during the civil war, these were the same people who actually went back and settled in Sri Lanka and that was the endeavor of India to actually send all those Tamil people who had left their homes in Sri Lanka to go back to Sri Lanka. So I cannot take the name of the individual communities here. Right. I cannot take the name of every individual who has traveled to and back from the, uh, as a refugee migrant, right? Uh, so the link of Satyanarayan, the link of the Ministry of External Affairs, I will post it back again. Uh, I have already shared it at the top of the chat. You can actually access it. Can you not see it? So I will post it again. I will post it again in the comment section. You can take it from there. So you can take it from there. All right. Hope that solves everybody's queries. Any more queries? Any other thing that you want to ask or are we sorted? Okay, folks, with that, I'll end today's session. For any more queries, you can post it in the comment section.